This is the Lions Unchained podcast, where the shackles of your mind are broken. It's not for the faint-hearted, but the chosen few who've embraced the call to leadership, dare to venture where others will not, and believe in God's supernatural power. Join Carl Joseph now for a life-changing word. Get ready to be unleashed into your destiny. Friend, Noah's flood was real. Hands down, it was a fact, not a story as many secularists often couch it. What? You really believe that, Pastor? I mean, come on. Eight people get on a boat with a bunch of animals for 370 days? Are you kidding me? Yes, friend, there are boats far larger and heavier than Noah's Ark sailing the oceans today. They also take advantage of God's ideal length-to-breadth ratio of six and a half times as long as wide, being the optimum choice for the buoyancy of vessels as Noah's Ark demonstrated. Friend, the scientific evidence backs it up. Noah's global flood was real, and that's what I'm going to cover here today. The fossil record, in fact, shouts and screams of an archaic, cataclysmic, worldwide deluge. Friend, the biblical account has come under such attack recently, and there are Christians out there who've succumbed to the notion that God is real, certainly, but that he used evolution to create man. What? Our God wasn't creative enough or smart enough or strong enough to create man in the first place from the dust of the earth? But he has to use an unproven hypothesis by an admitted atheist called Charles Darwin to create us? No, friend. My focus today, however, is not why God sent the flood, and I'll discuss that in a later broadcast. But right now, we're focusing today on the flood as actual fact. May I also remind you that I'm a pastor, not a scientist, and I'll do my best to share the data with you. Friend, let me begin by saying that there are 500 cultures around the world. Each and every one of them has an historical account of a flood. And these are independent records, I might add. I will name a few of them for you in a moment. But what does the National Geographic magazine have to say about Noah's flood? Well, in their article, Ballad and the Black Sea, The Search for Noah's Flood, they wrote, and I quote, Almost every culture on Earth includes an ancient flood story. Details vary, but the basic plot is the same. The deluge kills all but a lucky few, unquote. Hans Schindler Bellamy, an Austrian author and researcher, in his book Moons, Myths, and Men, estimates that altogether there are over 500 flood legends worldwide. Ancient civilizations such as China, Babylon, Wales, sorry I had to get that in there, Russia, India, America, Hawaii, Scandinavia, Sumatra, Peru, and Polynesia all have their own versions of a great flood. In fact, friend, if we go down the list, there are at least 30 nations that have an intricate historical record of a worldwide flood under many different names. There's also mention of animals coming aboard an ark in almost every account. Some skeptics down the years have claimed that only two cultures have a flood account in their history, and that would be the Bible and Sumer. Others claim the story of Gilgamesh to be merely a copy of the biblical account. Friend, like I said, there's over 500 cultures sharing a common worldwide flood event in their history, and this cannot be discounted as myth or coincidence. I will now read for you at least 30 nations that have accurate historical global flood accounts. Number one, in Australia, we have Kurnay. Number two, in Babylon, we have the Barossus account and the Epic of Gilgamesh, having a large ship built of wood and pitch. Number three, we have Bolivia and the story of Chiriguano. Then number four, Borneo, we have the story of Si Dayak. Number five, Burma has Singpo. Six, Canada has the legend of Cree and Montagne. In number seven, China has Lolo. Number eight, Cuba has the story of original natives. Number nine, East Africa has Massey. Ten, Egypt has the Book of the Dead. Number eleven, Fiji has the tradition of Walavu Levu. Number twelve, French Polynesia has Rai Te. Thirteen, Greece has Lucian's account. Fourteen is the nation of Guyana having the Makushi account. Fifteen, Iceland has Edis. 16. India has two, the Adaman Islands and Kamar. 17. In Iran, we have the story of Zen Devesta. 18. Italy documents the deluge in Ovid's poetry. Number 19. The Malay Peninsula has the story of Jekun. 
Number 20, Mexico has the Codex Chimalpapacoa. Number 21, Mexico has Hukol. Number 22, New Zealand has Mairi. Number 23, Peru, the story of the Indians of Hurachiri. Number 24, Russia has Vogel. Number 25, Alaska has Kuluches and Tlingit. Number 26, Arizona has the legend of Papago. Number 27, Hawaii has Nu'u. Number 28, Vanalua has the Malensians. Number 29, Vietnam has Bana. And number 30, Wales has the legend of Dufan. This list was provided by Northwestern Creation Network after much research, and I give credit where credit is due. These flood legends are different in some of their details, but the core elements remain the same, friend. Some portion of humanity was housed long ago with animals in an ark in order to escape a coming deluge and is ubiquitous throughout the world. Stephen Peet, another scholar, wrote in his Story of the Deluge from the American Antiquarian Magazine in 1905, and I quote, There are many descriptions of the remarkable event known as the Genesis Flood. Some of these have come from Greek historians, some from the Babylonian records, others from the cuneiform tablets, and still others from the mythology and traditions of different nations, so that we may say that no event has occurred either in ancient or modern times about which there is better evidence or more numerous records than this very one which is so beautifully but briefly described in the sacred scriptures. Now believe it or not, we have a good description of Noah's flood in Psalm 104 verses 6 through 9 and I'm going to read that for you now. Verse 6, Thou coveredst it with the deep as with a garment, the waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled, at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys, unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. Friend, in verse 6, God's word clearly states the waters of the great flood stood above the mountains. So the question we should ask is this, is there any evidence in the earth that water stood above mountains at some place in the ancient past? Indeed there is, friend. Did you know that millions of seashells and petrified clams have been found on the top of Mount Everest? Yes, I said it. You heard me correctly. On top of Mount Everest at 29,000 feet above sea level, we have evidence of seashells at the highest point on Earth, which corroborates God's word with the sea levels exceeding the mountain peaks in the Great Flood. So how do seashells and clams get to the top of a five-mile mountain? Because Noah's great flood covered all the mountains of the earth. That's how. Just as it says right here in Psalm 104. Seashells have been found in the Great Plains, the Guadalupe Mountains National Park, Jefferson National Forest, and the Anza Barriga State Park. Seashells have been found in some of the most bizarre places, and friend, the flood really was global. Heck, we've even found fossils of blue whales in the middle of the desert. The fossils of whales could never have reached these locations without a global flood as the Bible records it. But what other evidence is there? Well, did you know that cities have been found submerged under the oceans of the earth in various locations around the world? This clearly reveals that at some point in the distant past, sea levels were much lower than they are today, and this is verified by the great fountains of the deep being opened up and rain for 40 days, as described in the Genesis account. Underwater cities have been found in Alexandria, Egypt, the Bay of Kumbe in India, Quan Feo in Thailand, Havana, Cuba, Kekova in Turkey, in the North Sea in Europe, and finally in Tybrind Vig in the Scandinavian Denmark. Another reason scientists discount a worldwide flood is they contend that biblical creationists ignore the Ice Age, which is well documented. But friend, the reality is the Ice Age was actually caused by Noah's flood. Answers in Genesis provides an explanation of this apparent contradiction in history. Because Noah's flood was the greatest catastrophe in Earth's history, and because the fountains of the deep were opened up in addition to the precipitation that occurred, ice was able to form over about a third of the Earth's surface after the flood. This flood would have reshaped the Earth and radically changed its climate at the time. The extreme changes caused by the flood to the Earth's surface would have resulted in volcanoes during and after the flood and warmer oceans following the flood. It was when God opened up the fountains of the deep, described in Genesis 7:11, that these volcanoes would have started. 
Millions of tons of lava and hot water reservoirs would have been spewed from the Earth's surface in the ensuing months, and this warm water would prevent the formation of ice in the sea. Consequently, under these conditions, snow would fall in the polar regions and the middle latitudes of the Earth, later turning to ice. Creationists believe this ice sheet that covered the northern hemisphere was about 2,300 feet deep and took about 500 years to accumulate. It took a further 200 years for this ice to melt away from all the regions of the Earth. Friend, it's not a question of was there either a great flood or an ice age, but both occurred in the distant past, and Noah's flood was the very cause of the ice age in the first place. And friend, let's not forget the Cambrian explosion. This fossil explosion puts a dagger in the heart of Darwin's hypothesis of natural selection. Why? Well, if you recall, Darwin had a branching tree with a common ancestor at the root, with different modern forms of animals coming from it. According to his theory, in the ancient past, you had one form of animal until they evolved into a different form at the top of his tree. But these major differences are not evident in the fossil record. The Cambrian explosion reveals all these animal forms appearing all at once, with no record whatsoever of our ancient common ancestor, as Darwin hypothesized. Most of the fossil record, friend, is the graveyard of the flood of Noah's day and not the result of millions of years of deposition as the secularists claim. Variation within the gene pool does not constitute evolution, my friend. I quote from one famous scientist. Quote, the Cambrian explosion has generated extensive scientific debate. The seemingly rapid appearance of fossils in the primordial strata was noted as early as the 19th century, and Charles Darwin saw it as one of the main objections that could be made against his theory of evolution by natural selection. Friend, the fossil record shows a sudden emergence of new biological forms and structure, and the suddenness of evidence in the historical record defies Darwin's evolutionary theory. As the fossil record clearly shows, the mechanism is not incremental or gradual, but sudden and explosive, with not one case of a transformational species ever being found. His sincere hope was that over time, his transformational species would be found in the fossil record. But alas, they never were. Why? Because God created man, that's why. You don't have a monkey in your family tree, friend. Darwin's conundrum was never solved. And even today, this Cambrian explosion is barely mentioned in textbooks taught to children in our public schools. Darwin's tree of life has well and truly been turned upside down by this Cambrian explosion. But who even knows about it today? Common sense tells us that if animals suddenly appear in the fossil record out of nowhere, it's either evidence of creation or repopulation after a major event like the flood, but not evolution. But we know that major event is Noah's flood, friend, as documented in God's word in Genesis 7. Then there's the woolly mammoth, of course. Some of these animals have been found frozen in ice, showing these living organisms still had undigested food in their stomachs and sea pods in their mouths at the time of their death, in addition to the sudden covering of their bodies with liquid. Does this not describe a very rapid cataclysmic flood that took their life instantly for the world to see and they were later frozen in the Ice Age? Friend, I have presented a modicum of evidence here today in my broadcast. My fear is that if we don't reveal the truth in the realms of paleontology or archaeology or science, then who will? Can we leave it simply up to scientists to reveal the truth, many of which have a biased view and have never given their hearts to Christ? I'll leave the answer up to you, friend. You've been listening to Carl Joseph and the Lions Unchained podcast. Carl is a minister who has witnessed God's miraculous power to save, heal, and deliver. Carl covers topics such as geopolitics, current affairs, cults, societal trends, and end time events, all through a biblical lens. Every Monday, new podcasts are uploaded, so stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out carljosephministries.com for exciting articles, teachings, and discussion points. See you next week, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button.